Welcome to the Macmillan Report. I'm Marilyn Wilkes, your host, and today our guest is Professor David Skelly. A professor of ecology at Yale's Environment School, Professor Skelly is interested in animal ecology, conservation, and management. His studies of amphibians are directed at determining the causes of patterns such as evolution and the extinction and establishment of populations. Today we're going to talk to Professor Skelly about rapid evolution the idea that evolution can keep pace with environmental change. Welcome, Professor Skelly. Thank you. Much of your research um, is focused on amphibians. How did you become interested in them? Well, uh, I went to graduate school thinking that I was going to study fish. I had been interested mm -hmm. in fish for much of my uh, childhood. And when I got to the University of Michigan, where I went to graduate school, my advisor had switched to amphibians. And so I started my first study uh, with amphibians and have learned that they're a very useful group to study. Mm -hmm. Your latest research um, looks at species when they invade a new environment. Tell me about your research in Australia with the cane toads. Well, this uh, work is a collaboration with some colleagues at the University of Sydney um, who have been watching the cane toads move across the Australian continent. Uh, they were introduced intentionally to try to control pests in 1935 and they kind of failed in that assignment and then they overstayed their welcome and they've been uh, spreading across the continent um, and they're, they're a problem uh, because they're, they're toxic uh, and in being toxic they get picked up by native predators, by people's dogs in their backyards and um, those animals that try to eat them often die. Uh, so uh, Australians care a great deal about cane toads. There's a very amusing documentary movie that's been made about their spread. Um, but seriously, they're a big problem. Uh, so, so one of the big questions is, how far are they going to get and how fast? Mm -hmm. um, we, we tackled that problem and came up with a, a kind of a surprising answer. And that is that um, they were going to go uh, a lot farther than people had originally suspected. And that, that garnered a great deal of attention in Australia and elsewhere where people think about invasive species. Uh, the reason that was interesting is because it looks like the reason they're moving so far so fast is because since 1935, they've evolved. And that's really surprising. OK, so what does this mean for um, the management of the species when it's introduced? Well, that's a good question. Um, what it means essentially is that managers and policymakers that are trying to monitor and make decisions about how animals move across uh, international borders, across oceans, need to consider whether that animal is going to be the same in the new country as it was in its home country. And the emerging answer is that we can't count on that. Uh, so the tried and true method of doing some field trials and saying, well, this thing lives on this, in this kind of an area and it eats this kind of a thing, we may not be able to depend on that. And so that means that there should be greater caution when we're trying to use animals for good, as was the case with the cane toad trying to control a pest. It wasn't able to do that very well, and then it's turned into something else that's living in environments that no one would have ever predicted based on where it lived in, in Central and South America. Wow, so it could be quite the problem. Yes. Mm. OK, the second um, element of your research um, deals with the study of evolution in response to changing temperature. Right. Um, what are you working on now? Well, so our, our other rapid evolution project is looking at a North American species. And th this is one of the first times in my research career that I've worked on uh, what happens to local populations um, with ramifications for thinking about a global phenomenon. Most of the time, ecologists, if asked, what's going to matter for my population, would start giving you answers that are based on local factors. Well, there's, uh, it's, it's um, sunnier here, or it's shadier here, wetter, drier, whatever. And usually that's, that's based on local habitat differences. But now, for the first time with climate change, uh, ecologists are forced to deal with the idea that what may matter most for their population, or certainly may matter a lot, is something that's happening on a much bigger scale than their populations exist on. Uh, so in this case, we're working with North American species that live in a whole variety of environments. Um, they live in deeply shaded ponds. These are amphibians that breed in the water and then emerge onto the land. But they have to go through this life history stage in these ponds. And um, the, the ponds can be either cool and shady or warm and sunny. And so we're using this as a surrogate for understanding how 
um, these same types of animals and other animals may evolve in response to climate change. So we've got cool conditions and warm conditions that can change very fast, just as the trees grow up or they get cut down or a hurricane knocks them down. That all happens on the scale of decades, the same kind of scale that we think climate change is going to happen on. These species, it turns out, respond uh, evolutionarily to these changing uh, temperature conditions just as the environment changes at the same pace, as far as we can tell, so that uh, the animals that live in these cool, shady conditions are actually able um, to do a few tricks. Um, they choose, the, the tadpoles choose where they're going to live based on temperature, so they actually seek out little sun flecks in the pond to raise their body temperature, which helps them grow and develop faster. They have a higher critical thermal maximum. That means that they can survive warmer temperatures if they live in warmer environments and cooler ones if they live in cooler environments. And they also um, will develop faster in colder environments if that's where they live. And these differences exist on, on a stone's throw uh, sort of a, a distance scale. So a shady pond right next to a sunny pond will have frog populations that have evolved to those local conditions. This is really surprising to evolutionary biologists, and it's dumbfounding to conservation biologists. Even though um, conservation biology has biology in its name, and even though the cornerstone of biology is evolutionary biology, most conservation scientists don't think about evolution at all. Um, they've, if they've learned anything at all about it, they've learned that it's too slow to matter. And what we're discovering with this study, the cane toad study, and others is that um, it's typical probably in nature for evolution to be just as fast as environmental change. That doesn't mean these are big, huge changes. It's not one species turning into another, but they're big enough to matter. They're going to change how these actors in the environment behave, and they're going to change how they interact with others. It's going to change the ecology, so it does matter. Mm -hmm. So why is it important to understand how global climate change can affect species? Well, the temperature changes that we're looking at on the order of three or four degrees Celsius are the same changes that are expected to happen over the same half century or so. Uh, and and the, the temporal scale of the, the trees falling back or growing up is about the same as well. So we're looking at a phenomenon that's happening at the same scales that global cha climate change is presumed to happen. And temperature is temperature. So if, if they can evolve rapidly in response to the kinds of temperature changes we're looking at, we're fairly confident that they're going to evolve in response to um, these other changes. Changes. Now, there's two ways to view this relative to climate change. On the one hand, people um, who uh, want to argue that it doesn't matter can say, well, so species are going to be able to evolve. Um, there was a study that came out a few years ago that said up to a third of all species are going to go extinct because of climate change. Well, our group would argue that um, that number may be a bit high and that um, a great many more species, instead of going extinct, are going to undergo natural selection. Anything that can threaten a species with extinction is altering survivorship and growth and fecundity of that species enough to also pose a selection event. And so um, many more species are, are going to change. Um, now, some of these changes can be viewed as an impact of climate change as well. So some fraction of species are going to go extinct. Some greater fraction are going to be different because of climate change. And some of those differences are of concern all by themselves. Um, selection often tends to narrow genetic diversity. And as we narrow this kind of biological diversity, the ability of these species to deal with future challenges may be compromised. Um, the other thing is that we want to conserve biological diversity in general. And we, we um, you know, conservation biology is this kind of melange of, of societal values and um, hard-nosed science. And um, our job as scientists is to provide the scientific information, but the people who get emotional about this stuff, and there are many of them, want things to be as they were. Um, now, whether that's realistic or not, that's what they're concerned about. And what we're showing is that even species that don't go extinct are going to be fundamentally changed because of climate change, many of them. You have said that the reason we get sick is because the environmental context has changed and that the way we change the environment may come back to change us. Can you elaborate on that? Sure. Um, some of our research is in um, the ecology of disease. Uh, e disease ecology is somewhat different than medicine in that uh, 
in medicine, it's been traditional to focus on the patient and to um, learn what the symptoms are and then treat those symptoms. Um, disease ecology is a perspective that's focused on um, why plants and animals, including humans, but, but in this case non-humans, why they get sick. And you, often um, the, the kinds of things that make uh, animals sick are around in the environment all the time. Um, so there, there are pathogens out there that are just there all the time. But what, what happens um, to make uh, an individual sick is that the environment challenge, challenges you somehow and may weaken your ability to resist disease. Um, many people will uh, n have anecdotes where they feel like um, they got knocked down by, by something and, and while they weren't feeling well because of that, they got infected. Um, those anecdotes are probably based on real, real things that happen to people in many cases. And um, the concern with global climate change is that uh, we're going to be putting perhaps more people or certainly different groups of people in situations where they're going to be challenged by the environment. And in so doing, we're going to subject some populations to, to greater likelihood of disease. And those diseases are selection events, and humans are still evolving to deal with those. So that's where that quotation comes from. Do you think we should be concerned about rapid evolution? Um, I think we should be focused on rapid evolution uh, in the sense that it's something that's real and it matters. Um, and the way that I can bring that home to people is uh, you think about the flu vaccine that you got this year. Um, when we think about uh, medical intervention, people don't think twice about um, how evolution figures into the way we live our lives. But there's a group of people out there every year that try to forecast the evolution of the flu virus. Um, they, they look at what flu was around where last year, which ones are growing, which ones are shrinking, and that's how they make up the cocktail that we get injected into our arms every year. Um, so in certain contexts, it's not controversial and it's totally under people's radar screens. But when we, we try more, ra more broadly to say evolution matters and we need to deal with it, um, I think what we need to do with the public is be more specific. How do we deal with this? Once we establish that rapid evolution is something that we can expect, um, how do we use that knowledge in a sense to um, try to uh, have evolution work for us or at least not against us? Uh, a great example is um, the way we harvest fishery stocks, both in freshwater and marine environments. Um, for most of the history of, of managed fisheries, we've taken the biggest individuals, and over time, what we're, we're, we're causing is uh, fish to mature at smaller and smaller sizes. And so the average fish that hits your dinner plate is getting smaller and smaller. And that has its own uh, ramifications for the species survival in the wild. Um, it, it also influences uh, the economics of the whole thing as well. So it really matters in that sense. And finally, um, this is being recognized, and we're now managing fishery stocks in uh, more sophisticated ways that may allow fish to become bigger and to preserve brood stocks that will, will keep uh, fish larger and potentially healthier, healthier, better able to resist predators and so on. That's a great example that can be extended um, to the way that uh, we move species around. Um, when we're going to reintroduce species in the wild, we should be thinking about the genetic stock that they came from and, um, and maybe even forecast the way the environment's going to change before we move something into the environment. There are many examples like this where uh, rapid evolution can just help us do a better job. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much for being here today with us and sharing some of your research. Thank you. For more information about Professor Skelly and his fascinating research, please visit our website at yale.edu backslash Macmillan Report. Be sure to join us again for another episode of the Macmillan Report, made possible through funding from the Whitney and Betty Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies. Mm -hmm.